<laughs> and we're live. I well, see. Yeah, I can't share. I'll do it. <clears throat> we got somebody on there. How do we see the comments? No. We were able to see the comments last time. I'm sure to come up somewhere. Hi, Milta. Hello, Milta. Welcome. Hold on. Milta, just in case, I'm not sure. Did we show the book last week? I don't yeah, she has it. Yeah, we she went through she it. Sent, she sent the link. Okay. She worked it out today. So how far did you get, Milta? Dun, 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 dun. Does she have the MP3s as well? Because without the MP3s, it's a little... No, I don't think she got the MP3. We're going to need your email got it not too far okay no okay so it send us your email oh maybe i think i might have it and then we can go from there so that you can get yeah. the actual mp3 because the mp3 goes over some of the definitions that um she has listed here and it kind of fills in some of the gaps with the workbook. So it's, it's good to hear the MP3. And then on, and then when we go through the work, the workbook we're supposed to do, I guess, on our own time. But today we're going to go like through through the, the gist of it, like the foundation. And then we'll be able to go through the workbook on our own. And then we'll regroup and then see what we've learned. Yeah, yeah, I can, I definitely, yeah, you definitely need the, the MP3. And then honestly, she has, she also has a book. <laughs> she also has a book um, called The Practice Dictionary. And she breaks down some of the words in that as well. It's a really good dictionary. Like there's words in there that like she breaks a lot of things down. So if you want to invest in that, if not, then because the doctrines, there's some words that I couldn't find. And so I had to do some research, but we'll get it. We'll get it. All right. We got four people on. Guys, comment below so that we know who is here. We're waiting for our people to get in so that we can get started. Give it about a few minutes and then we will begin. Yes. Let us know you're in the room. We need to know if you're here. We are taking attendance. We're taking attendance. <laughs> Plus, we want to know. If you guys are actually interested in hey James, okay, if you're actually interested in taking this class, we know we'll let you know what books to order and you know how to keep up with us. And after today, we plan to do it on the Zoom, so it's so much easier to have everybody in the room interacting instead of just sitting here while you're just listening. All hey, right, Crystal. hey Crystal, whose face is that? I don't know whose baby is that. I really don't. All right. Know. We'll talk about that. So, <laughs> all right. So the majority, the majestics of the majority are in in, in the room and the presence of the Lord. <laughs> I was going to do a court order. <laughs> So let's just pray. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for today, God. We thank you for what you are teaching us. We thank you for the wisdom. Oh, my goodness. We thank you for the awakening in our minds. We thank you for the seeds. Oh, Lord, we thank you for everything tonight because you really put this together, God. And so, Lord, we just honor you and your presence. And we recognize that you are in the room, God, and that you are here and you love when the saints gather together to talk about you and your things. So, Lord, here we are. And I ask that you would bless it with an increasement in our soul. Get our soul right, God. And Lord, we seal it in the name of Jesus. Okay. Amen. So. <laughs> We're just going to go over that comment. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So then we started in unit one. 
Okay. And you, if you got your books, which would be the small book, um, I'm sure you would have went through the small breathing of unit one, but we're going to go through some of it. And, um, and so, okay. So we are doing the ABCs of apostleship book one. We're going to go through units one through six. I want everybody to understand that these, this teaching is going to take long. It's not going to, it's not going to be done probably not in eight weeks, probably not in 12 weeks, it's going to be a journey because everything has to be broken down and everything has to be segulated. Like everything has to become a reformation in us. And so it's going to take a, a while. So don't, like Matilda said, like, so I, I felt lost. That's fine. You know, and it reminded me of something. It reminded me of when I was going to medical school and it's, you know, the teacher made it announcement like hey you guys are just coming into a field that speaks japanese and i'm gonna give you good counsel don't give up give it three weeks until it becomes a normal language for you and then if you decide this is still chat you know japanese it's not working for me then you give up but in this case like you can't give up because you are really looking to really understand the true gospel you're really looking to understand how god operates and how jesus actually is not just a prayer but the very essence of his being is here and so we're gonna we're gonna unravel a lot and there's gonna be a lot of things that are gonna that are gonna um maybe offend you <laughs> you're gonna get offended you're going to get offended. You're probably not going to tell anybody you got offended. And that's just going to be the case. But you're going to have to let the truth work out that offense in you. Remember that. Let the truth work out that offense in you. Let the cutting begin. Okay. So in the beginning of the series, um, she talks about the outgrowth of this course it's to develop to develop to teach and train apostles several years ago is the reason why she created this book when she realized that in the in the process of this training that everybody had to learn this it wasn't just for the teaching of the apostles everybody had to learn this why did everyone have to learn this because it was important that you understood what the difference was between sitting under an apostle than it was um, sitting under a pastoral and what the difference in the two were. And is it a difference? Absolutely. I can tell you that it's very different because you can walk into a room and this is not to downgrade the pastor. I'm going to make it open that it's not downgrading the pastor it's just basically stating that the pastor sits in a certain rank the apostles sit in another rank and so those ranks are important because if you were to be going to work and you are you know in your job and you don't have managers there's going to be no management in the place there's going to be an a chaos a disorder and it's going to be you don't want to work there because you don't know what you're doing so you have to have somebody in position to be able to direct the people in the job as to what they need to do. What, what are you here for? What's your purpose to fulfill? It's the same in the kingdom. The world got the concept of, of, of the kingdom strategy and took it for themselves and implemented it into the structure of the world. So always remember that what we see here was already pre-designed by God. And so, um, so it's just a different rank. And so, and, and each and we're going to get into that. What does that mean? What does that look like? So that means like I might be one superhero. You're another superhero. And we do two different things. Right. That's right now in English how I can break that down. <laughs> so let's go to down to page two. And there was something I highlighted. I'm probably not going to read it all. But in page I'm sorry, page 10. It says, I saw that those to be effect, affected by the mantle's restoration, most had yet to understand its benefits in them. I just finished stating, you know, each superhero has a benefit. And so I will benefit you in one area, but then another superhero benefits you in another area. And so you have to understand the benefits of the difference of sitting between underneath each office. Okay. 
I can tell you that I can come into a pastor's leading in a church just to explain a difference. And I could feel like there's a, a ceiling over us, like there's a limit. But if I come into an apostle's teaching, there's no limit. I'm free. The worship's different. And it's not to say that they're doing anything wrong. It's just to say that they're in the wrong position. That's all. They're not where they should be. And if there was an apostle over that, then there would be a greater realm of freedom because of the covering. And we're going to talk about that. And trust me, I wasn't really big on the word covering. <laughs> so we all had our little process through this. Page 11. On page 11, it says helping you comprehend the need for apostleship in a modern church. I see a giant step toward erasing the belief that those claiming to be apostles are all heretics. OK, mm -hmm. and that means that's a person who who is believing or practicing a religion in error. That's what that means. OK, and then the ABCs of apostleship is going to equip you to sort out the matter for yourself and confidently share what you learned with others. So let's look at the slide. In this unit, we are learning the missing link. Okay. You and the series in this. What do you have to do with all of this? Because you're the missing link. Okay. So defining the apostleship and the purpose of this book. What's the goal? The goal of this unit is to launch you into the apostleship journey so that it makes sense to you and the everyday Christian. Understanding why apostleship is a divine commission instead of just what? String of international missions. I love that because they've made apostleship like he's supposed to be like out there everywhere in nations and, and doing all of this. And that's all it is. But that's not true. They are fathers and mothers of the church. They are fathers and mothers of souls. Let's look at it like that. They're fathers and mothers of souls. Right. And it's a different avenue when you're a father and you're a mother to a soul because you're more involved. Okay. So this unit is going to introduce you to the apostleship by exploring biblical and early church apostleship. To lay the foundation for the unit study with definition, keyword, scripture studies to teach you what makes apostleship important to God. That's so important. As I was going through this, I'm like, this, this matters to God. Yes. And, and, and I'm going to touch on it. it. Why it doesn't matter. We're going to talk about it. To show you how and why apostleship has suffered so in the Lord's house. To teach you God's brand for apostleship and to condition you, the everyday Christian, to discuss and understand and appreciate the apostleship in the church. They're one of the reasons why I feel like the Lord has taken us to this place where it's called the very beginning is because we were running an apostolic center and I was getting frustrated because I did not understand why people couldn't grab what I was teaching. Though it was a oh and a ah moment, I didn't see transformation. And as a parent, you long to see transformation in children. And so what happens is, is that the, the frustration was coming from me being a forerunner, seeing before time, seeing what could happen, seeing what God is glory and not understanding that it took a process to get you there. So I have to take the journey now with you from the very beginning and get you to this place so that that way, when the Apostolic Center is actually functioning, you actually know how to function in it. OK, so I want to deal with titles. Before we go any further, I need to clear up this title situation. I am so, can I tell you, I'm, I'm so done with people talking and bashing titles. I'm over it. I, I, I'm going to make this statement clear. Just because you had a bad taste in your mouth from one church, do not disregard all churches because of it. That's like you going to work having a bad taste in your mouth about that day and never coming back to work. Right. And then how about this? How about always identifying that field of work with that bad taste? It, it's not true. You cannot judge one, one thing, one thing that offended you and, and, and put it to everything. It's the wrong judgment. And so I just need to clear this up because we had the wrong mindset about the title. 
everyone's like, well, why do we need a title? Listen, why does the manager need to be known that she's a manager or he that he's a manager? Why do we need to know that that's the boss? Why do we need to know that that's the president? Why do we need to know that this is the CEO? Why do we need to know who they are? Because it shows the value of importance of where they stand in line. You would not act a certain way with the president or the CEO of the company as you would with your coworker in the kitchen. Right, right. And I'm going to explain that that very moment right here that I just talked about is called modified behavior. It's called I know how to act when I'm around the ones that I respect and value. And I know how not to act or what I don't need to do when I'm around other people. Christians have learned to modify their behavior, but not have not learned how to transform themselves. So instead of the behavior actually becoming a personality factor, it's become a robot factor where you know how to shut it off and when to turn it on. And what we're learning is to get you to a place where you stop modifying your behavior because you know in God you're supposed to be good, do good. No, we have to get to the place where it is good. It does good. It does nothing like we, we're not controlled by these emotions or the fractures of our soul. Okay. And if you allow that frustration and fracture, you need to take a pause and find out what is triggering your fracture. Right. Because is it serious enough for you to be fractured and act that way? It's just things we need to start looking at and opening our eyes that one of the, even with this being said, I'm learning even now more that people as grown adults and we're looking at them all around us, they're in our work field, they're in the schools, they act like the very age of the trauma they endured. And it b- blows my mind because they're 60, like you're like 80, 90, 10, it doesn't matter. And you're stuck in this place. And that's, that's called the rust of development. And the, and what we're doing right now is we're pouring in this truth into the body of Christ to begin to take out the immaturity and the trauma and the fracture of your soul that it's not to be modified, it's to be transformed. So we have to regenerate. There's a regenerating process that's not happening if we're still modifying our behavior. Okay, so look at the title. Titles, it says, what is the definition of a title? It's a name discussed upon a person or a thing to signify a structure, function, authority, or sapphire or influence. So like we explained, the president, the CEO, the boss, the manager, we all know from their title, their function. Right. Okay. So when you have a title, one with an official title empowered to execute the duties prescribed by the title. So now... If I'm manager, if I'm owner, then I had the power to execute duties that is given to me through what I've been entitled. Okay. And guess who else has titles? Small gods, goddesses, and spirits. It's interesting that when it comes to studying deliverance and demonology and all that stuff, everyone's interested to know what rank these spirits sit in. Everyone's interested to know what tree this spirit comes from, what leaf, what root, but no one wants to hear it when it comes to the body of Christ that there is a solid reverence for those who are in rank in the spirit. And one of the reasons what I think God is uh, uh, highlighting title is because we've lost, guess what title, The the primary title in the church, which is fear of the Lord. Right. That title's gone. No one fears God. GD is is thrown everywhere. God's name has been blasphemy. He's been mocked. He's been made ridiculed. No one has a fear of the Lord. And that, that is what causes the judgment of God to fall on the land. Not just the hearts of man, but the fear of the Lord. The fact that you can't reverence and understand that his holiness is omnipresent. He's in the room when no one is in the room with you. He's there at all times. And so the title, now I want to look at this. So now we get that it is a prescribed, it's a prescription. The doctor gave you a prescription. It's going to do its duty. It's going to empower you to get better. Okay, let's think about that. And so now you have a title that has to follow up with the duties attached to it. Right. 
Okay. So now, title back in time. While attempting to resolve the question of the fivefold and its use of titles is what may be called principle of institution. Okay. I know that sounds like what the heck are you saying? When they were attempting to resolve the questions of the fivefold, they started to try to label it as a principle of the institution. Okay. So, but here's the, here's the good part about what really happened. So the church leaders were constantly wrestling with its ministry titles and offices on how to define its ministers for identification purpose because they did not know where to begin because they were not given the revelation or the wisdom or the gifts to identify because they were in the wrong position doing what they believed was best not because they they some of them truly honestly believe that that's that's all they knew nobody never taught about the fivefold they didn't want to hear about it so the structure so then you had structure phobia mm. okay there was a structure phobia that much of the modern church feel for they feared and the order of it. Okay. They feared it. It might take control. We don't know what this looks like because we don't. So when you don't know what it looks like, you get scared and you disregard it because you don't know what it looks like. That's not healthy. Healthy was to pursue it in scripture. Healthy was to pursue God in it. You know how many hours in prayer, pastors are in before the Lord. You you would think that that was one of the things they would have sought out. There's something missing, God. There's something missing. And so they, they were scared to fall prey to something that was false and error. Okay. So this caused the Protestant leaders and their assemblies to cast off all restraints. They were saying the old was damaging the new. So here's your example of what happened. We don't need leaders in Christ. We need partners. We don't need structure. We need fellowship and freedom. We don't need ministers, ministers to tell us what to do. What is this? I can't see my screen here. Hold on. Let me open it. Okay. Ministers are not to tell you what to do. They are merely guided. They will merely guide you to the best of your decisions. And, and the congregation... By this, virtue became worldly. They became much smarter than the, the priest itself. And I'm not talking Catholic priests. I'm talking about the actual priestlyhood nation that God declared. Wow. So they, they became smarter than the clergy themselves. And then we wonder. Let's see, can I get. Let's see, I can't get to the bottom of this last one, but I can check it here. Hold on. Okay, so this backlash as seen today sent God's house and its order in the opposite direction. Mm, Jesus. So this backlash, okay, that we are witnessing from the Protestant church leadership that was like, you know what? Let's do away with the old and let's bring in this new. And instead of needing church leaders, we're just going to, we're going to get partners. And instead of um, having structure, we'll just have fellowship and freedom. And instead of us having to be accountable, We'll just guide them with the best decisions they make. And then this is what brought the world's the worldly system into the church. Right. And then everybody in the church was smarter than the, the pastors. Everybody in the church was smarter than the staff. Whoever was there, I'm smarter. And so that is your church background of what happened when they started to disregard the titles. Wow. That's insane. I like the fact that you actually brought that up because... I mean, the title not only brings, like, it's a reverence to God, but then it's the honor to the person. Like, there's there's an order of rank. There's a chain of command. Even in the workplace, there's a chain of command. There's a person you go to before you go to this person. Before it's the last, like, the last person would be the manager. And so the chain of command is when people see that, they have to honor their position. Like, as a regular employee coming into a business, we have to honor the position and give them the respect that they deserve. So in reality, well, they your boss the same way. Huh? You're not gonna tell your, you're not gonna tell your boss off, and you're not gonna tell your manager off. You're not. You're and most. You're gonna. You're gonna, you're gonna bite your tongue before you even say anything. You're considered so. rebellion, and so that's what it sounds like was taking place. They didn't want. They didn't want the structure. They didn't want the order. They they didn't want to be to be told what to do, so they rebelled, and so it was rebellion. 
And so we're still dealing with that now because if you look at the conditions, let's go back and, and this is a condition. They they don't want to be held accountable for for their patterns of sin. They don't want to be held accountable for that. I don't care. Like I'm I, I God's not gonna take it away. I'm sorry. Like the sinful nature in us was already taken care of at the cross. It is our 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 responsibility to fight temptation. God's not just going to come down and radically do it. Like everybody thinks that He's just going to come and rac- radically just whoa, poof, we change. No, it's His word. It's His. It's in being in Him. It's when we abide in God. And you know, when you're not in Him, you lose the joy. You lose your peace. You lose things. And people can tell that you're struggling and being in the abiding part when you don't have any of those factors or your factor, those things are quick to be taken from you. So then there's still a process that needs to, that you need to go through. And it might be elementary, but whatever the process may be, like Paul says, if we're still on milk, then drink the milk already. Let the milk firm me in you, but get it done. Like get, get, if that's all you need to work on, get it done. Because at this point, you're not going to get a magic genie that's going to come down and say, here it is. You've been totally transformed. No, you're only going to be transformed by the truth. Bottom line. Okay. Now let's look. Let's look at this part. It says titles do not infect hearts, infected hearts, but corrupt titles and position. Right. Oh, I love this part. So here, here we go. This is what this is what happened to the titles. Blame shifting is a very human response to our embarrassing, irritating, carnal weakness. From Adam's pointing the finger to Eve, to her blaming the serpent for her and Adam's fall, the defense still passes on down the line. Historically, self confrontation. Look at this part. Write this down. Self-confrontation is a major test of what? A person's maturity and inner integrity. So you got self-confrontation. God puts you through a self-confrontation to take you through a test so that you may mature and that your integrity may grow with it too. But because this test no one wants to ever do, they often fail and stay voided. Unfortunately, this adversary crops up again in our question of God's reinstatement of the fivefold, particularly with God's reinstatement of the offices and the apostles and the prophets. Let's go to the next screen. So the next one, for some reason it's crunched down, but Okay, titles do not inflict hearts, inflicted hearts, but corrupt titles. Remember this. It's not the title. It's the heart of the person that's inflicted. It's infected, and then it begins to corrupt the position, okay? So you can't say that every pastor you've ever met was horrible. You might have had one, but you can't say all. So therefore, you can see where the heart of this person was infected. Now, let's look at this. Settling into a position of power, it worsens the ego's dysfunction Mm -hmm. so that only evil comes out of whatever good the promotion intended. Do you hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If someone is given a position of power and their heart is infected, the ego... The dysfunction of that pride. Okay, guess what's going to happen? The evil comes out. Even if the promotion was given out of a good heart. So good or bad, the leadership are not automatic rewards for success. They are the evidence of the motives that drove the success. Okay, so good or bad, it wasn't automatically the reward wasn't the success. But the evidence, the evidence of the motive that drove that success, how they get there. So titles are merely names that have no power on their own to alter a person's personality, behavior, conduct, even outlook on life. So the title merely, it just doesn't have power 
to alter a person's personality, I'm going to say that again. The title does not have power to alter the person's personality, behavior, contact, and even the outlook on life. That is a heart issue. A heart issue. Yeah. Why do you think you don't give people titles in ministry until their heart has been truly tested? Okay? So the surface, as the person takes on the duties and the responsibilities, look at this. These things will surface as the person takes on the duties and responsibility of an office and its associated pressures. What I love the most, I mean, it's right there. The minute someone gets put into a position, an office that they're in, they're called to, and then the pressure starts going on, everything that's ugly in their personality, behavior, and contact comes out. Yes. The pressure starts to press down on it. That's why I say, that people will say, take time. Make sure you get your heart right, purify so get all that stuff out. Because when the pressure falls, it'll all expose itself. You don't want to be exposed by everybody. That's, that's what they often say. You don't understand what they're saying. What they're saying is, if God puts you in the office and he puts you in a position to operate in a certain level, in a certain place, no matter what that is, remember, your personality and behavior, your conduct and the outlook on life is not going to change because you have that title. Right. Okay, that's an inward work. So when the offices affects contact, the when the offices affect the contact of the human heart, inclinations and infections of the character will surface. So when the office makes contact with the human heart, the infection and the inclinations of that character will surface. Wow. Calling one's work by its name, identifying or recognizing what it is by what it does, it's not of itself corrupt. Hmm. Okay? So understand that the titles is not corrupt. The titles is not something good. You know, it was there from since the beginning of time. Titles were already there. Why? Because it revealed to you the, the, the level, the position these people were in. Okay? What corrupted the system was the heart of man. Okay. So, however, placing one in position, they seek for the purpose of authorizing their natural pro proclivity to abuse others while energizing and empower their own hatefulness. It is misleading to suggest that people disregard or abuse of authority downplays its legitimacy in the body of Christ. Okay, so next slide. Okay, is this it? Nope. Next slide. Okay. So here you have the final slide of titles. To answer to a functional breakdown, it's not throwing the church away, but investigating its source and correcting what is malfunctioning. So we don't just go ahead and throw away a church. Like you just don't go ahead and go into your job and throw it away. Do you see what I'm saying? Like something happened yesterday. Okay, let's go back and just throw away. No, you have to investigate the source. Right. You have to go into that place and investigate the source and correct what is not functioning. Okay. But unfortunately, the typical response of a Christian to imperfection is complete knee jerk rejection of everything. I cannot tell you how true this is, okay? How true is it? It's funny, we have more grace for the people in the world than we have for our own people. Like as if our own people came with this perfection. Right. When we all came from the world system. We all came through sin as well. Nothing is different with us as it is with them. The only thing is different is that we have the truth. We should have the truth. And with the truth, that's what should be leading us. That's what should be forming us. So the fact that when something happens in the church system and Christians are seeing it, oh, look at this imperfection. 
all of a sudden now it's a rejection to everything. That means that what they preach, what they teach, what they're saying, what they're not saying, they reject everything about that system, about that church. They, so there's no receiving, you know, a long time ago, Joyce Myers, I said something and he, and I, I it stayed with me forever. It says, listen, if you go into a place and you know it all, might as well stop going to the church because you're never going to learn anything. If a person goes in always rejecting everything, they're going to look for anything to reject. First of all, rejection will start looking for something to reject. Right. There, it's, it's like any moment now, any moment now, any moment now, I'm going to see it any moment now. What a horrible way to live. What a horrible way to be in the body of Christ. Constantly being suspicious about something getting ready to happen because rejection's coming. That's awful. And it's not of Christ. I've never seen Christ do that biblically, nor would he have time because his mindset wasn't like down here. So rebuffing God's leaders and their rightful position only serves to insulate faulty human egos it is not only deceptive to imply that titles make monsters but also it puts a discredit to those who spread such a nun shit and perhaps culpable of degrading god's divine church order so it's saying that if we go on and we continue to take titles and dismantle it and and, and act like it has no value we're not just spreading a discredit about the church. Okay, which by the way, the church is is the is the sign to people not only of the hope of the glory of Jesus Christ, but to the sign that that is the house of God. And so when we start doing that, when we start breaking down to a place where titles have no value, we are discrediting the house of God all in itself. Because church is God's house. That's a title. Right. What is church? God's house. God's house is a place of worship. Church was not designed to come and worship you. Church was designed to come and learn how to worship the one who created you. How do I live a life that is pleasing to God, not me? So, so anyway, the tactic is an inevitable backfired and a once solid restraint against believer rebellion. Okay, there's your backfire. We have not caused rebellion, disobedience, and we overthrow anything. Look at this, dissolving in the succeeding generations. We're overthrowing the next generation. So this generation's responsibility to keep stewarding what is true and not stopping speaking the truth and, and, and continue these teachings, the, the teachings of the apostles, so that their the truth does not fall away from the next generation right. because the next generation is falling away because they're not hearing truth. They're thinking that, that the system of the church is everything as, is, as it is and everything goes, and that's not true. So God's people and their society suffer spiritual backlash from breaking all the Lord's restraints. That title, amongst other things, has much to do with it. Today, that is what the church leaders face in the wake of the consequences of fostering contempt for God's ordained authorities. You notice that a lot of people have been talking about that the restoration of the fivefold is coming to place and they're all talking about it and they're talking about what God's doing and this is the order he's doing. But have they really realized that it is going to take um, a hard check in all of the body of Christ to accept this? Right. That this is coming into play and it's an order and are you willing to actually honor and value that this is the system that God is bringing in? Because there's some people who've been hurt by apostles and prophets and whatever the fivefold and they don't even want to hear from them. Right. So when God starts to restore that, are they going to embrace them or are we going to lose that soul too? Okay. So these are things that we have to keep in mind that it's it, that. The truth is not just for me, but the truth is for the world. Okay, so today, that is what the church is facing. Oops. 
that came out of my page. Okay. So let's see, abounds and ministers as well as leaders in all walks of life struggle to capture the Pandora and return her back into the box. But the church's wisdom and righteousness are shut out of all human sapphires, courts, judges, politicians, social activists, all mark it invalid and influential. How can this be? So now we know that the system itself is already declaring that God is not even real. He's just a, you know, fracture or a fiction. And even she said that, you know, she teaches that the paraphrasing of scripture is really, that paraphrase is really saying that it's not really a fact. It's a quote. Wow. So now that we got over the titles, this is really something you need to work out in your own system. Let's look at what we're dealing with next. Okay, so in this, we're gonna look at the scripture focuses. Okay, the, script, the scripture focuses are located in your book. We're gonna be going through them, back into them, back and forth. You're gonna remember these scriptures because it's, a, it's pretty much the majority of the scriptures we're gonna use throughout the, the teaching. And so next thing, you're gonna have unit keywords, okay? Now, unit keywords, like we talked about before we started, the MP3, you're going to have to go back and listen to that. Pay attention. The definitions for some of these keywords are in there. You just need to pay attention. Take your time. I'm going to tell you the MP3s, I usually listen to them four or five times because I don't want to miss a thing. And sometimes you're in the middle of hearing it once, I'm not going to remember what it all said. I have to go back. And then I go back. And then, and even if I write it down and I go back and I listen to it again, dude, I'm telling you, I listen to it four or five times because I want to get it. I want to get it. I don't want to just do another work um, where it's not sustaining. It's not staying. It's not regenerating itself. Right. Okay. So, um, I wanted to look at something else. Okay. I want you to understand that this is a whole new dimension of kingdom wisdom. Okay. This is a kingdom wisdom. And the process from this book is what you were going to get. You're going to get wisdom that you don't hear anywhere else. You'll probably start hearing more of it because people are being taught through it. But there's a wisdom in this that you're not going to get anywhere else right now. Anyway, until all become teachers <laughs> but this is to help lay hold of the eternal purpose as a christian as well okay now i just want to go to page 12 of your small book page 12 says about maybe one two three four five six lines down why apostleship is about God's and nation and how apostles distant message and doctrine verifies the God's head. Okay. Uh, you're going to learn that the apostles have a message and they always will. They will always carry the same message. Okay. So apostleship is a divine commission. Okay. Now look at this. I'm giving you one of the keywords. The apostleship is a divine commission instead of just a string of international missions further different di different, different yes ah, okay it from others oh from the other offices okay why apostleship thrives on kingship ambassadorship increases your appreciation of its kingdom message this is why we're teaching it i wanted you guys to know that the reason why we're teaching this is because we want you to understand that there is an increasing in you and when you come under this type of teaching i'm telling you your whole inner being will prosper and i'm talking about inner being okay will prosper and if your internal being can prosper everything around you will go into place because of that wisdom All right Okay, let's see. Let's go on a little further. I highlighted something here. Okay, let's go down to the bottom. 
a little bit after the third paragraph, it says, besides all this, you will also appreciate how apostleship uniquely exists to defend and promote the God's head throne. No one in probably ever in my walk has ever taught about the Godhead. Mm. No, That's ever. So this is, this is going to be the first, probably for all of us, to talk about the Godhead. Okay, and it's and the fortify its stronghold on present and future generations. So all these realities are so because the apostles, the ecclesia is more than a church in the same way that a kingdom is more than its temple. To the apostle, the new creation, ecclesia is God's everlasting nation birthed by his son, Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. So this, for, this realization is what motivates an apostle to refuse to under, undermine the church. See, I'm, that's one of the things we don't do. We do not undermine the church. It was created on purpose. Right. Or the ministers. And it says, why apostleship promotes the new creation as the only God-ordained way to enter into the Lord's Ecclesia and therefore become the citizens of the eternal kingdom. Last uh, paragraph says that these ABCs explain what makes Christianity the almighty promised nation of kings and priests to God in Christ and demonstrate the apostleship's role in it. Okay, so let's look at, let's look at this. I want to talk a little bit about the apostolic leadership. Here I show, I'm show i showing you the apostolic house and the apostolic leadership. What's the difference? So the local, for the apostolic house, it's the local church institution that serves the totality of the New Testament deposition represented by the full offices. Okay, so the book of Revelation says Ephesians was the apostolic center. OK, so an apostolic house is a apostolic center where all offices are in there, even the workers, the miracle workers, the healing workers, the, the ushers, all of that are in there. And it's just a just a mix of diversity and it is full of power. OK, I call it the powerhouse because you can feel the power of God when all is functioning as they should. OK, so now look at the apostolic leadership. Being the foundation of the church, apostolic leadership is the cornerstone of the New Testament. Revelation, look what, look what we teach. We teach on the revelation, on the meditation, and the education. It is the key to the apostolic development. Okay, so we are always emphasizing on development. We need you to become. That's, the, that's the, the common goal. We need you to become. You must become. Okay? So what do we focus on? The religious teachings and the apostolic organization. Next. I want to make sure I didn't miss that. Okay. So the next thing. What is driving what is the driving force of an apostle? Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. It says that the seven angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of the Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. What is the driving force? Lord, king, and it must be here on earth. Right. It's the driving force. Heaven on earth, it has to be. What is uh, what is in heaven must be on earth. There's no no questioning that. That's the driving force. And when we don't see that force, then we see an opposition. We see something that needs to be taken care of. One of the things that I'm looking at when I when I looked at the apostolic house, it's a house of solution. You have a mix of people with many different talents. Many different answers to many different solutions. Yes. And if you don't activate people to understand that those moments of their talents must be used, they're not supposed to be buried. And how much more effective could we be? If you understood that this is an apostolic house and all your being must be put on the altar for God to use. 
Okay. All right. So let's go into our workbook. Okay. Actually, let me see if it's in the workbook. Maybe not. Not yet. No. Not okay. So we're not yet there. We're going there. I, I kind of mix it up a little bit, so that's good because you guys will be working on it. But let's look at the three important things that consumes that consumes the apostleship. Okay, what is consuming it? So you got the three G's, the guarding, the governing, and the guiding. Okay, the first one, the guarding, they are consumed with his new creation ecclesia. The governing is the second one, his father's kingdom according to his righteousness. We, we won't have anything else. We won't, the justice is a God, nothing else. There's no extra added, but what maybe we can alter? No. We govern according to the kingdom of his righteousness. And then the guiding the future generations into the salvation of Jesus Christ. Where else would we send them? Everything must always go back to him. So those are the three things that consumes the apostolic believer. Okay. It's not just the apostle. The apostolic believer is consumed by this. Okay, like you just love the new creation ecclesia. You love coming together. You know, you love being with one another. And, and that consuming begins to mold a treasury in his house. And how the gathering is on a, you know, it's okay. And it's not to be clicky. But like, let's say, for example, we've had, you know, a church. Okay, but let's say that you have in common something with another group. All right, great. And they get along really well. My thing is maybe what we need to teach is imbalancement and letting people know from the beginning that this group, that the reason why we're so clicky is because we have this in common. And that's, that's but try not to get clicky where you disregard the others in the body because people need to have understanding. Okay, Um yeah. I can understand why people join together because they have a common vision. When you have a lot of people and they're and they're coming together because they have a common vision, you have to learn to sh to mature them and teach them that even though we have a common mission, there is a time and a place for that matter. When we are together, it's all of us. Right. And so that that's the mindset that's going to be regenerating the the body of Christ because now it's going to be, I am about my father's business. That's what it's going to be now. It's not, I am about my own business. Now you're going to get a group of people that you're going to start seeing that they're sold out for the father's business. That's it. There's nothing else for me. Okay. And then let's go on to the next one. So we did the three. Okay. So if you look at your book, um, page 16, it talks about that. It talks about the three important duties. It's the three things that consume us. Now let's look at the book of Acts. We're going to Acts chapter 26. And um, it's not verse 28. It's verse 18. Right. So that is a typo in an era, Milta, if you're still on, because I know we found one earlier that I forgot to tell. But it is a typo. And so... Um, yeah, it's Acts 26, 18. Fix your books. Okay. So this says to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Then I looked up the Aramaic version. That you would open up their eyes so that they will turn from darkness to light, from the authority of Satan to God. Hold up. We're talking about power that is authority. When God gives you his power, he gives you the authority of him to do your father's will. So here it's saying we need to turn them from the darkness to the light, from the authority of Satan to God. 
and they shall re receive release. Listen to this, receive release from sins, a portion with the holy ones by faith, which is in me. Let's look at this. Because, you know, we're not just going to leave that there. So scripture says the eye. The eye that Jesus was speaking about here was of the mind. Let's go back and see what that says. Open their mind to turn them from darkness. Okay. Open their mind to turn to worship the true God. Open their minds, Lord, that you will turn them to worship the true God. And then the darkness here that he speaks of metaphorically, he's speaking of the ignorance, respecting the divine things and human duties. Okay, the accompanying of the ungodliness, the immortality, together with their consequent misery, consequent misery. So your darkness that he's referring to, or should I say the darkness that he's referring to in the scripture, it's about the ignorance that you don't respect divine things nor human duties. No. It's about how you accompany ungodliness and immortality, and together you mix it up with your misery. Oh, we could go into that. We can go a little further into that, but we're, I'm just going to touch it. I'm just going to touch it. <laughs> Don't even touch that. The fact that he says the darkness here, it's your ignorance that you don't even respect divine things nor human duties. You don't respect it. You don't respect the titles. You don't respect that pastors are on their knees for hours praying for people in his church. You don't respect that the fact that some of these pastors are actually taking abuse from people because they don't respect the divine things of God. Jesus. You know, everybody wants to talk. Everybody wants to bash. Everybody wants to cut up because of one bad experience. But yeah, what about the ones who are truly doing their divine duties? The ones who are truly doing the will of God, the ones who are actually fasting and praying for people to really get converted in their congregation. Why do they have to suffer? Why do they have to get disrespected? Why is it that we choose to be ungodly because we're miserable? Because we won't get right. So now let's look at the second, uh, well, the third, fourth part, the power and the authority, okay? And this part of the scriptures is, is talk about a delegated authority. It says a person whom which the authority is given or received, the power to rule or govern, the power of him whose will and commands must be submitted to. Hmm. So going back where he says the authority to Satan back to God, that they would take their will away from Satan and turn it back to the father, that their will will be his will. Instead, their will is Satan's will. That's why he says some, some sons are of the father and some sons of are the devil. So this is that cross right here where he, where they're talking about there's some that are with the father that are the sons of the father and there's sons who are sons of the devil. Okay. And it's all because they willingly, willingly are choosing. Absolutely are willingly choosing because you know, when you're in darkness to, sur to surrender, look what it also says. It says to be possessed to be possessed by the person who you give an authority to worst worst thing you could ever do is hand over your authority to anybody that will put you in a place where they will possess your will 
Because even humans will do it. Why? Because they're being used by Satan. There's got to be a, a line that you cannot cross. Okay, here's a side note. I thought this was pretty interesting. And this part came from a scripture, part of the scripture in Matthews, when he Matthew Come talks about on. the light. Yes. light. It says, if the light that is in thee is darkness, darkened, if the soul has lost its perspective power, then how yes. great is that darkness? Come on. How much more than the bodily blindness? So look at what he's saying. If that darkness is so dark, do you understand that the soul has lost its power? To perceive. Come on. To perceive the good, godly, holy things. It's lost the power to do the good. Jesus. And so imagine how dark you really are internally. Yeah. All right. When I saw that scripture that came to mind, I'm like, when he says open the eyes of the blind and it's like the soul our souls have become darkened because our perception has been thwarted like the the, the perception of god the perception been of god's sovereignty has been completely corrupted and therefore our souls and our eyes have been darkened so when he's saying to come awaken like come shine light shine light first on the soul so that the eye can be open like it's it's powerful all right, so that Acts 16 is the last of the small book. That was page 17. Okay, go into your workbook. So the workbook, um, we talked about the objectives and the goal. So we did page 14. Um, the scripture focuses the unit keys. We did that. Well, I showed you that. I need you guys. You're gonna guys. You're gonna have to find your definitions, okay? And that's gonna be some work for you to do, okay? So let me see here. All right. So I'm gonna go through 17 briefly, but let's go through this. I'm gonna go through some more slides. So let's look at the apostolic rule. Everybody knows a rule is a rule, right? That rule sets the boundary, sets the, the line. So the apostolic rule is a spiritual and supernatural domination installed and maintained by the creator God in Christ. It operates as a sapphire-shaped principality. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Everyone's scared of principalities, but you are a principality. Hello? You are a, you're a shaped, you are, sh you don't even know what you look like in the spirit. It's a principality overseen by the apostolic angels of the Christ church. Who's overseeing this church? The apostolic angels that is assigned by Christ's church. These angels, they direct God's, uh, Christ, uh, the apostles in their government of the church as well. And that, where you can, where can you find that? Where can you find the book of Revelation? See the seven angels. They're directing the church. The seven angels are assigned to the seven churches. They're directing the church. And one of the things that when I was reading this, I'm like, well, that's interesting. Because every time at the apostolic center, we would have our prayer nights. They show up right. with direction. They show up with direction. They would show up and tell me what's going on, what they were doing, what God was doing in the spirit. And I would feel them. I'd smell them. I knew them. I felt them. And they show up. You just can't explain. Like, I don't have to sit around and tell you, well, someone had a sash. I'm not. No, I'm going to tell you exactly what's happening in the spirit. I don't need to tell you all the details. What you need to know is what God's doing right now and be a partner of it. Jump in on this. Angels are, are ushering the, the direction and the will of the father. And so <clears throat> this was interesting to know that that's an apostolic rule. That means I don't have to do anything. That means that it's already, it's a rule. It's, it's automatically, it's a law. <laughs> you know, if you are an apostolic believer and you are in an apostolic church, you better believe that there is an angel that's an apostolic angel assigned to that church that is giving directions to the apostle. Okay. This is why, okay, I'm going to bring this up. This is why I know right now 
that we are throwing around apostle prophets imagine to all this, these titles around without the true authenticity of it Okay, because angels will tell you what's happening in the supernatural, and we are caught off guard a lot for the last two years. For the last two years, not many people are hearing what is happening in the spirit. And so they get this unction, they might get this feeling, they might get whatever, but we're not getting solid direction. Fine. And so when people say, Well, this, you know, they're, they're an apostle, and I'm like, be careful, tread lightly. Because the duties to carry that, it's not just anything. Like you just don't show up and do things normal. You know, you have a responsibility and a duty. All right, so let's go to the next one. I want to talk a little bit about being commissioned, okay? You're commissioning, okay? It says, what is being commissioned? Commission is one sent forth with specific assignments, a duty or a task by a principal. OK, when you are commissioned, you have a specific assignment, you have a duty and a task by God. OK, so the apostles are specifically commissioned officers for the New Testament. OK, there's scriptures on the screen that will help back this up. We're going to talk about it a little bit more, but I want to talk to you about one thing. Being commissioned is literally God taking himself and applying himself on you. And he mantles you with the power to do these assignments, to do the duty and the task. You don't do this on your own will. He will empower you with his power. He will graft himself on you to be able to do this. Okay, what does that look like? It's the Holy Spirit who has all these things sitting there waiting for you to grow up and come into your assignment. Next slide. Okay, let's, I wanna go into some keywords and I'm not gonna go into too many. I just picked two and I'm gonna tell you something. The mantle treatment is not on there, but the mantle was. Okay, so the mantle it reflects what? The latitude, the structure, the prestige, the provisions of the wearer, as well as the license to act. It is our spiritual covering. Okay? It's our spiritual covering. People say, well, that's the Holy Spirit. True. But it's also the Holy Spirit's job to give you or bring you into a place where he knows your faith is ready to go to. So can you imagine what's holding, what Holy Spirit's holding, withholding, because you're not ready. And it's not because you're, you're not skilled for it. It's just that you're not ready. You have not been trained in the full truth to be able to enter into this door. Okay. So what's the mantle treatment? The mantle treatment, this goes beyond the normal church attendance. It goes beyond your Bible studies. This is where we mentor. This is where the schools of ministry come into place. This is where we do apprenticeship and we win those that are, are to come into the office and train them how to operate. We're literally leading them to that place of maturity. And these are the things that believers perform more Okay, more confident, go more in confidence in their call. This is where they become competent. This is when you can do it. Okay, well, okay, so let's talk about let's talk about the difference between the gift and the operation. Because I knew that this would bring bring something up. Because why? Because you've been taught so many lies about a mantle. Because you've been taught false error about how the Holy Spirit works and, and you, the limitations of it. Because we've been taught that it's just, you know, normal church and then Bible study and nothing else is needed. Oh, you don't need to go to school. Holy Spirit's to school. That's not true. Then why did we need Paul? Why did, why did Timothy need Paul? Why did they need Peter? Why did they need it? Okay, how about this? Why did they need Samuel? And Samuel had a school of prophets. Why do you have to do a school of prophets? They need a school. There is a fine line and the line is not even thick right now because the fine line has come from a place from 
thinning out truth. Now we have to make this line thick again. So it'd be solid foundation for people to walk on. I mean, why would people go to school and you want to become a nurse? You can't just walk into a nurse station and say, I'm a nurse. Nice. I heal without your certification degree. You got to go through the process of training. So it's the same thing in, in the body of Christ. You got to go through the process of training because you need someone to hold you accountable. You need somebody to be there to tell you, no, that's not the way it is. It's this way. You need to, you need someone there to help structure the regeneration process to make sure you're constantly being regenerated. Okay. Let's look at this gifts versus operation. So look at this. I'm going to try to make it clear. Your prophetic gifting is the ability to possess a person with the capability to publicly display a prophetic tendency, okay? It's a natural ability to operate in a gift under the unction of the Lord, okay? So now we know that the prophetic gifting was whatever gifts of the Spirit, you know, God has given you, it is, can publicly be displayed under the unction of the Lord, okay? So the gifter may present itself not steady under the person's command until the person enters the sapphire of the prophetic as an agent of the office. Mm -hmm. So the power and the ability to do it effectively, very little wasted on a competent level. Okay, let's talk English. People are gifting all around. Everybody's gifting. Everybody's a gifter. You very few you find people who operate in, in a, a higher level than a gift. A prophetic gifter will sit around and tell you prophecies, tell you visions, dreams, blah blah blah. But at the end of the day, they have not. Let's sort of say that. Let's say, for example, let's say prophecy only falls on them on a place of an unction of the Lord, and they have to wait for the unction of the Lord for them to prophesy. As opposed to coming into the office and prophecies automatically a skilled network that it does not matter. I cannot shut it off. There's your difference. So because the gifting is not skilled, it's not trained, it's not equipped, it's not brought into a, another level of operation. It just remains a gifting. And when the Lord gives me an unction, I'll let you know. It, instead... Instead, when you're in a higher level in the office, when you come into the operation system, the gifting, it's, it's, it's just, you just can't shut it off. It's automatic. So the gifted must be educated, trained, tried, and refined before they can hope to operate their gift, prophetic or not, as a skill. So the gift must then become the skill. No one never thinks like this. To think that you would have all the gifts of the spirit to say, and it is a skill and no longer a gift. It's almost like, like I have a skill. I am a phlebotomist and I can take out blood work. It's a skill because I can hit the vein when right where it needs to be. Right. Let's say that that's a skill. Okay. But if I go and I say, I'm a phlebotomist who never takes out blood work. Or let's say I take out blower, but I don't, I don't, I'm not skilled at it. I, I do it occasionally. I do it when I'm asked to. <laughs> then it's not a skill. It's just something you know how to do. It, it's something you inherited. Like the gift you inherited from the Holy Spirit. It's your job to bring it into a place of skillfulness. So without the proper training and the pruning, the best of the prophetically can pro provide a sporadic brilliance with the consistency of dull prophetic outcomes. I can't stand those moments. You know, the moments where they say, come on, friend, we're going to pray for you. Okay. And then, and then you get there and then you get these generic prophetic word, you know, a generic prophetic word that you could get to anybody. It's so generic. It's so like, like, it's just dull. And you just know that it came out of their being and not out of the prophecy. That is what I'm talking about. 
that's that very sporadic brilliance I came up with and with my dull prophetic outcome because I choose not to skill my gift. So, and it's so, I, I just can't stand it. I cannot stand it. I've had that done to me more than once and I'm using that one to go up and for prayer unless we're being forced to get up. And when I finally get there, yeah, exactly. A Walmart brand of prophecy, like, please stop. Like, you're genericizing everything and you're you're coming up with these sporadic ideas of what what it could be because you saw something that might attach it whatever the case may be it's not it's not sharp it's not accurate it's not articulated because you didn't you didn't skill your gift so they repeatedly fall short of the prophetic span they need or are called upon to reach okay so let's this bottom part I think we talk a little bit about Samuel. Let me see. I got to get to my other slide. Okay. So you can see some prophets are multitask. Here's an example. Some prophets can multitask. They can do pretty much any part of the office. And you're like, how the heck? While others are just prophesying. See the difference? You'll find one that say a prophet, another one say a prophet, but this prophet does all these things, and you only prophesy. That's exactly the difference between the op the op operation of the office and the one who's just gifting. This is skilled. This is not skilled. This is just okay with just a gift. So an example, an example: Samuel the prophet had a gift until his training was complete. That what he did naturally became what he was doing skillfully. So once the shift of power merged, the priestly with the prophetic, it succeeded. His prophecy was elevated to the office with all major features. And then guess what? He taught others. Because he took what was natural to him and made it a tool brought it into existence he skilled it out so much that he could teach somebody else how to do it people were up on the mountain prophesying i love this love it i'll never forget it. it's part of my scripture that i love when when um, saul sends out for them to kill david and they hit that corner where all the prophets are prophesying and they fall into prophecy and begin to prophesy right. who's doing that where are we seeing that now a school that will teach you in, into that place of skillfulness that when you come un under it, here's your, here it is. When you come under it, you fall into it. Mm. When you come under it, you're falling into it. That is the apostolic. When you come under it, you fall into it and you become. So... That is the difference between the gift versus the operations. And I have to touch these things because one, first of all, we had to clear out titles, get that out of our mind, get it out of our system, crutch it because it needs to be deleted. And the second factor is, it's like, okay, we can teach you on gifting the mantles and all that. There's keywords there, but at the same time, do you know the difference between being the gifter and the operator? Do you understand that you that you have to come from out of the place of gifting to be to be the full worker? You know, you'll find that in the Bible when they began to build the temple and they said that he prayed and he they got to get these. The Bible specifically said, I brought in skilled men to begin to be the architect to build my temple. And then if that wasn't enough, then the skilled men brought an apprentice and the apprentice were being trained under the skill of that men. Come on. Where are we in society? How do we think that that is so oblivious for today? Hmm. And here's what really gets me. Everybody wants the book of Acts church, but they don't even want to live like the book of Acts people. Just that, that, that generation. So that heart was different than what it is now. I would love to see you sell your house for something that everybody needs. Sell your car for something that everybody needs. I want to see that. Because then I say, wow, this is the book of Acts. That's, you, you can't just say, I just want part of it. You want something, you better ask for the whole thing because you're going to get the whole thing anyway. Because if it's biblical, God's not giving you part. He's going to make sure you get the fullness of that weight. 
Okay, so let's go to, and we'll be wrapping it up. All right, go to page 17. These are ideas that we need to stress. All right. It says the first one is a glaring void that exists in the Lord's 20 or so year effort to shift his church's primary leadership to apostleship. Okay. These are things we're going to learn, guys. I'm not telling you that you're going to go off and I need you to start writing in here just because it has lines. <laughs> These are things we're just going to learn and we're going to stress and pay attention to. Like 20 years. You know, why, why does it take it so long to bring a shift that is true? Because of the opposition of it. The opposition of what? Of what we're teaching people. It's not like, you know, it's not like the enemy's coming up against us. It says on this church, you know, hell cannot prevail. Right. The reason why it's prevailing is because there is darkness. And where darkness is, there is legal right. So with truth, the light of truth, we will remove the light of darkness. Second thing, you, the everyday Christian, have to know apostleship from God's mind to your world and not the other way, not the world to God's mind. So we got to turn some things. We have to turn some things around. The people that apostles are being raised up to affect and empower have little to no idea of who they are, what they are, and why apostles are important to their lives. Um, in, the, in the chapter... In our first unit chapter, actually, it talks about the importance. Why is an apostle so important? Why? Because they bring out the eternal purpose in humanity. They bring the eternal purpose out of a soul. That's why. It's not because they're, they're this major, like it's not about anything else but to bring the eternal purpose out of the church. God's purpose out of the church. <clears throat> and by the way, the church is considered a soul because it's full of souls. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the third thing, the people that apostles are being raised up to affect and empower have little to no idea. And we talked about that. So we'll go on four because apost apostleship is essential to God. It is, it is first in God's ministry order on earth and in heaven, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 28. You can read that because it's part of your scripture focuses anyway. And whatever you guys have question of or are struggling with, let us know. Because this next time we're going to go into the Zoom and we're going to all interact. I need to hear what is not sitting right with you. Or what gave you revelation? Making sure that we're processing this information correctly and in the right mind and in the right heart. Because that's important. And you might struggle a little bit, but it's only for a little while. Because the truth will always have its way. So, even if you try to oppose it, it's, <laughs> then you can't. There's no way to come with the truth and truth not be the victor. All right. The next thing, many members of the body of Christ have never come across the term apostle outside of the scripture. Studying your Bible along with the study guide biblically connects you with the apostleship to make it and God's use of apostles makes sense to you and your world. And the word apostleship surpasses the world word apostolic in dignity and effect right there. And back in the book, it says there's a difference between apostolic and and apostleship. What page is that? I believe it's in the workbook. I mean, in the. Is it in the workbook first page? The not the workbook. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's in the workbook. It's in your suggested ideas to stress. It's number six. Words apostleship and apostolic are not the same thing. And here it's telling you. It's saying that the word apostleship surpasses the word apostolic because of the dignity and effect. That's why. 
and we're gonna find out what that means. Don't try to get you know. Don't get all caught up into figuring everything out right now because you're not. You're talking about this woman took forty years to teach this. She's been teaching it for forty years. It did not happen overnight. So I don't want you to start. You know, I don't want you to fall back and think, okay, well, it's going to take me this long. I want you to really have a willing heart to know truth. That's it. To really know God. To really know God and who He is, and 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 get all that that error out. All right. Um, apostleship is a divine commission instead of just a string of international missions. We talked about all of this. Apostleship's must most apparent power it is its population, preservation, and perpetuation of God's kingdom on earth. To apostles, the ecclesia is more than a church in the same way that a kingdom is more than its temple. I love that. Okay. So here's your assignments. And you will be sharing. See what it says? Plan on sharing your information with the class because you're going to be sharing. I don't think everybody's going to pick four of the keywords all the same. Okay? So I want to hear it. I want to hear what you found. So guess what you're going to do? You're going to do page 19. You're going to work on page 19. Okay? It's, it's clear as day. It says, the keyword study, the learning value of this exercise is your increased ability to discuss apostleship intelligently using words that paint an accurate and credible picture of it from the Lord's point of view and not from your traditional commentaries, okay? So you're gonna use this aid to help you gain a broader understanding of the keywords found in this unit. Apply each keyword in different ways to show how you recognize their relevance. Okay, so you're gonna have your key term and that's, that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna pick four keywords and then you're gonna have source A and you're gonna have source B. Okay. What does that mean? That means you're gonna you're gonna look at it just exactly what she said, apply each keyword in a different way, in two different ways. Then it says list the scripture references that are related to that keyword. So you're gonna write the four that are related to that four keywords. It's not hard. Now look at this. The terms. That you're going to write, you're going to enter on the bottom, your keyword and your term, and then you're going to write what you're going to write next to it. Like, um, one second, because I'm going to find you a website that's going to help you. And it is. And I and you can use this as a dictionary for to find words that are similar to what you are studying. Okay. It shows you this. It will te It will show you words that are, are si similar. I love it. I've been. I was using it today, and it's such a good source. And so here is. That's the website. That's under .com. Oh no, I'm sorry. .org. .org. So make sure you put the .org, and it'll take you to that website. And you can use that dictionary, and it will help you find words that are common with your keywords to help you in this part of explanation on the bottom. Okay. And then I don't want you to do 20. Not yet because it's, because it's more in depth and I just want to kind of like wait off on that until we get a little bit more familiar with what we're learning. And then we'll take on those pages together. But you can do page 22 because that's simple. You know, using your book and your lecture notes, locate the missing word of the phrase. That's simple, right? So 22, I'm sorry, 20, 21, and 23 will work together. I don't want you doing that on your own because some of you don't, don't really know what you're doing, you know, because this is all brand new. And so it's easier for us to do it together so that there'll be a better understanding than it is for you to do it alone. I'm not, I, we're not here teaching this so you could be out there by yourself. I, I'm not into that. And I'm really feeling like in this season, um, like there's an issue with all of this, with the, with the internet and all of that, that there is an issue with isolation. And we are having a major problem learning how to come together. 
in even the simplest things as the word of God. And even though, you know, there's people having church service, it doesn't matter. People are still showing up to church and they're, they're, they're feeling really lonely inside because they are carrying the spirit of isolation. And what that does is that it keeps you disconnected. It keeps you not wanting to connect because, you know, you know, you'll come up with 50 million excuses why you can't connect. God's doing something to me. I'm going through something. 50 million things that the enemy will use to keep you disconnected so that you will not get the greater truth out of this work. And I realize that you, Matilda, you, you get what I'm saying? So I realize that this is a problem. That I knew that when I started this workbook and then I knew that we would start this work, that the enemy would rise up and try to to bring on a discord in either whoever's watching or whoever's part of the group not to want to get together and stay disconnected and call it good. That's not good. That's not good because there's no way in the world that you're going to tell me that you're going to go through this book and say, oh, yeah, this makes sense to me. Uh, Matilda even said that she felt a little lost. And she, you know, I, I know what that feels like. You're probably feeling like, oh, I don't think I'm ever gonna make it. This might not be for me. And trust me, people have gone and said that, but it takes time. And then they realize, man, it was true. I am of this because that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to make sure that you don't get in on this. He wants to make sure that you don't get the fullness of this. And he wants to make sure that you stay isolated so that you don't get the unity part of the revelation that is released when the two gather. OK, that's that's why the Bible says when the two gather, when the two or three gather, I am in their midst. And when God is in the midst, revelation pours out like never before. And you get all these highlights and there's those ooh ah moments and the good moments of being together and sharpening each other with the sword. But I'm telling you, I can't I we're doing this online because we are in transitioning of getting into the place and finding a center here and they can, but the, 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 this part here is not my thing. I prefer for us to be in unity with one another so that we're all helping one another understand what the, what the reality of this teaching is. And, and, and unity, Godhead, all of that is going to take time and it's going to take a lot of commitment and dedication on your part to stay connected, to make sure that this thing doesn't slip through the crack. Right. And there shouldn't be any cracks anyway. So if there's a crack, we got to find the foundation to heal that. We got to bring God to bring the healing into that crack so that you're not leaking out. Because this information is not to be leaked out unless it's, be, it's supposed to be poured out. Poured out. So, yeah. So only work on page 19. So work on your page 19. And then leave 20 and 21 for our next session. We'll work on that. We'll go over it. We'll look at what it looks like. What it, what is supposed... Because, you know, you look at it and you're like, what is this saying? I understand. But it, ha it, has, it has clarity. We just need to go through it together. And then the so 23, we're going to have a practice um, together and we'll be able to go in. On this. It's going to be really fun. And then we'll be able to enter into um, unit two. So we're doing this week. We'll probably have another week with unit one. And expunge some more stuff out of it. If we could touch on 20 and 21 together, you know, or maybe we need to come back and when we do the review. So it's gonna be today, next time we'll finish up what we what we can and probably do three for the review. Cause we have to make sure that we are grabbing, understanding, and that it's 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 coming before we go to unit two. Because after we're done with unit um, one through six, you'll be ready for book two, which is a lot more meatier. So we have to make sure that you're processing one and six correctly so that we can be able to do number two. And um, everybody will be with their minds more wide open to two terms and terminology and stuff like that but um let's see with that being said 
Um, okay, be prepared to share. And then that's that. So, okay, so what we need to do, we need to get Matilda's email address so that she can get a copy of that MP3. And we also want to let Matilda know that um, if you want to join in on the prayer calls, what time are the prayer calls and what day? Sundays at 5 a.m. Sundays at 5 a.m. So if you want to get in on that, if you're able to get in on that, then you can get in on that. Um, those Zoom calls should be recorded for those who can't. But we got to figure out why it's not happening. Anyhow, so you can get that information as well. Anything else? No, Crystal, do you have the workbook? And did you get the MP3? Because I, I, I can send it to you. Let me know if you guys didn't get the MP3. Let me know if you didn't get it so I can send it to you. Um, because there's actually two. There's the mind, Milta, there's two. There's the mind of operations. And then there's the um, apostleship versus apostolic house. I would definitely send her both, especially the minds and operations of the um, apostolic is it will it's like a checklist. This is who you are. If this is who you are, then this is who you are. And it's it's powerful. Like I've listened to that one five times. No lie. I'm not exaggerating. You want a message on messenger. OK. All right. Cool. And Crystal, let me know as well. I'll send it to you. I don't think you have it, but I can send it to you as well. And I'll get your email address. Yeah, that's pretty much it. No, I didn't get the MP3, but the book I'm getting this week. Okay, is that the workbook or the book? Because uh, I just need to know where you're at. Workbook or the book? That's why we need to do Zoom. Yeah. Workbook or the book? <laughs> one more time. Going once, going twice. <laughs> He's probably typing. I can't really tell. You can't tell. This is not a iPhone. Okay. Have I have to get the a workbook. Okay. All right. So then when you get the workbook, this will make more sense. I mean, I pretty much laid it all out on the power slide, but um, you'll be able to go through it again and actually work your way through it but again guys you're going to share your input on your keywords for 19 page 19 and don't forget that you need to do page 22 which is very simple and then the other ones will work on together and sweet so waiting on my set of book of course because you did not use amazon like i told you yes Zoom next mm. class. Yes. Zoom Can we next create, like, class. A Facebook page for the like a messenger a group page for or chat on Facebook for to send the Zoom links and things like that, or did you want to just send everything via email? I right, just uh, go ahead if that's what you want to do. I mean, just I'm just not really like you know, make it easier because it's melt a says that she wants it on messenger so you can probably let me see something i probably could just grab her in and just put her under the same one under the life group um wait that's not the right one what did you have the isaiah 60 discipleship yeah that's um, joyce and james are in so discipleship all right well we'll figure it out whatever is easier i know right <laughs> whatever simple right now milta all right so um, that's it for today pretty pretty wrapped up and then we got the information you'll get that and we'll go from there and until Thursday. Remember now we're doing Thursdays is before the garden. I was saying to send my 
I don't see to send my email address. Okay, I think we have it though. I really do. I think we have it. Remember from the woman's gathering, it's in there. All right, Father, we just thank you for today, God. It was so insightful, God. Thank you for clarity. Thank you for removing things that were hindering us and accepting, Lord, that you're reestablishing the fear of you, the reverence of your house, the reverence of your duties and the positions that you place people in. And so, Lord, we just thank you for that, just a touch of an awakening in that area. And so, Lord, we even pray now. We even pray now, God, for those who you put in duty and position in your church, God, to usher in the fear of the Lord and your reverence and how they so, you know, they just they just plow, constantly plowing and they're constantly covering the souls that you sent to them. So, Lord, we just thank you for that. We thank you how you preserve them. We thank you how you are all consuming them and they continue to pull forth, God, and continue to not stop it doing the good work, God, and not to grow weary. And doing good. And so, Lord, we thank you, God. And we say we bless the seeds that it would increase a harvest in this season in our lives, that it would increase a harvest in our life, that we would have the abundance of John 10, 10 in our soul and the fullness of his name. And Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, guys. I know. Can't wait till Thursday. (laughs) That book is so like, or should I say, (laughs) It's not even here. It's here. <laughs> we're, we're getting ready. On, on live as well. We're going to do Zoom for that one. Um, I don't know yet. We'll figure it out. If we could Zoom in on Thursday, that'd be great because um, everybody's feedback is, is better than sitting here and just can't hear nobody. Right. So, but yeah, I can't wait. Ooh, I can feel it already. I can't feel that book already on the way to the book. So we'll see you guys on Thursday. Be blessed. Um, any questions? Any, I don't know, comments, concerns, offense? <laughs> <laughs> Send them in. We'll work it out. All right, guys. Have a good night. <laughs>